Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome back to another season of Particle Physics for Kids Virtual Science Camps. It's great to have so many people here. Uh, great to see you joining. Uh, those of you who don't know me yet, I'm the, the host and organizer of Virtual Science Camps, Michael Gregory in Paris, France. And today we've got Jeff Wiener joining us from CERN. Uh, I'm really excited to have him on to, to launch uh, this season of Virtual Science Camps. Just before I turn things over to Jeff, uh, a couple of things. Um, first of all, feel free to say hi in the chat, say where you're from. It's exciting to see all the different places people are joining us from. If everyone who signs up comes, I think we have people from 19 or 20 different countries uh, with a whole bunch of people joining from France, where I'm from, Turkey, Spain, and Serbia seem to be the top four. Uh, so welcome to everyone who's, uh, who's joining us. Just a tiny bit of history, and if I drag on with this more than five minutes or so, someone please tell me to stop talking and turn things over to Jeff, because he's the the more interesting thing, uh, or the, like the more interesting uh, person you've come to see. Uh, but just very briefly, virtual science camps were an idea that I came up with about a week into the the first COVID pandemic back in 2020. And it was a way of getting students, mainly from my school, to do hands-on experiments with cheap things around the house. And I found after I invited people from all over the world, we had people routinely from 10 or more different countries. And I love being able to connect with that many people. So once schools were open again the following year, I thought, well, let's do something exciting still and keep connecting with so many people. And let's ask all my friends in particle physics at CERN, at the Joint Institute of Nuclear Research, at the Perimeter Institute in Canada. They've all been very friendly and enthusiastic about anything I asked them to do. So it'd be great to share that enthusiasm with students around the world. Uh, so that was kind of how things started off. And after last year, it was fun and exciting. And some of them said, well, you know, we'd come back again if you do it next year. I said, okay, that sounds great. Let's do it. So. Here we are for another season of Particle Physics for Kids. Uh, a lot of the guests are gonna be the same as last year with a, a couple of new ones uh, in the mix as well. A lot of interesting uh, virtual visits lined up as well. Um, so as, as you guys know, I'm gonna be turning things over to uh, Jeff Wiener, the Willy Wonka of Particle Physics before too long for tonight. Uh, those of you, and I sent out a message uh, about this earlier today. We had a science show uh, from Gurno at the uh, school lab at CERN that was scheduled for tomorrow. Unfortunately, that's needed to be changed. So I'll, I'll send out a message when I know that one will be, but that's gonna be an exciting one coming up. There's two or three other science shows from school lab at CERN that will fit into the next month or two. Uh, next week, there's an introduction to the Joint Institute of Nuclear Research in Russia that a number of you are signed up for as well. Um, that'll be a really cool overview of, uh, of that site, which is one of the hot spots for particle physics. Um, and there's going to be a, a number of lectures, both from CERN, from Joint Institute of Nuclear Research, and some virtual visits, including, and I'm really excited about this because uh, I, I get to go personally for some of the uh, virtual visits for the Joint Institute of nu uh, Nuclear Research. So I'll be going for the second time in my life to, to Russia to show you guys uh, around the Joint Institute of Nuclear Research. Well, to, to be shown around, but to show you guys around as well. Um, there's also gonna be a couple of uh, interesting teachers with really cool lessons who I've asked to join for this. Uh, and all that'll be coming up in the next couple of months. I'll send out a program for the second half of February, probably in another week or more. Um, bit of a backstory on that. I'll actually be in Ghana, West Africa with uh, Chris, the teacher I met at CERN. And we're going to try and do a couple of the ones, uh, the, the virtual camps while I'm down there, so that we can help make it more accessible to some of the students there. But it's very difficult to know my exact schedule ahead of time. So if I'm late sending that schedule out, um, I apologize for that. Um, I think that's enough of me going over what to expect in the next couple of weeks. Uh, just a couple of things, if you're not, um, well, it, yeah, ju just a couple of things before I turn things over to Jeff. Um, so it's great to see that uh, we can see a number of you guys with your cameras on. I'm going to say I encourage you to have your cameras on at the beginning and at the end when we have a question and answer period. In the middle when Jeff's talking, it doesn't really matter. I'm not going to be looking at you guys. You're probably not going to be looking at each other. 
But it's nice for those of you who aren't shy, especially if you're asking questions to Jeff, uh, that we can see you and it feels like there's real people we're talking to uh, rather than just a screen. Uh, and then if you have questions as he's talking, please try and add them into the chat and I'll decide if it seems like an appropriate time to interrupt him or if it seems like something that doesn't really fit with what he's talking about, then we'll leave those to the end. I'll try not to miss any of them, but if I seem to have missed your question, feel free to answer it again. Uh, there's 42 people in the, in the Zoom session so far, so if there's a lot of questions that come up, I might miss ones. Um, so again, if I don't get it to them, just ask them again. Uh, I think that's everything I want you to go over uh, before turning things over to Jeff. Um, so without me rambling on any further, uh, I know you've all come to see Jeff. I, I, I came to see Jeff. Uh, the Willy Wonka of particle physics, that's a nickname that I really hope sticks with him. Um, and welcome back. It's great to have you there. Thanks for joining us again, Jeff. Thank you so much for this way too kind introduction. I, uh, I'm very happy. And yeah, hello to everyone in the room. Um, oh my goodness me, what an honor to not only be asked to be back, because you know this, this is always a good sign if you're asked to come back after you give a talk and then to kickstart the new season. Oh my goodness me, that is awesome. And I'm very happy how many people have already joined the room. Uh, I already glanced through the participants list. I've of course seen a couple of names I recognize. So hello to those who already met me, uh, but especially hello to everyone who has not met me or who I haven't met yet, uh, because that's awesome. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, Michael just said, keep your camera on. Uh, I would try to do that, but uh, my internet is a little bit wonky today. So uh, I, I might have to switch off my camera from time to time. We will see. Um, anyway, I will have the pleasure of introducing you to CERN because that's the place where I have the pleasure and honor to work. Uh, you can probably guess that at the moment I am, of course, not inside the LHC tunnel. That would be unpractical it's a little bit cold there um, uh, and of course there's no access at the moment um, but um, yeah I'm usually on the surface of everything and I would tell you exactly why this place where I'm working uh, is really awesome and what it's all about for that I will now start by sharing my screen uh, which is a sentence that I feel like everyone who is Zoom, in Zoom meetings these days says it all the time um, and now I'm sharing my screen and Michael, please confirm that you see my slides full screen and uh, that it looks okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, coming through nice and clear. Nice and clear, fantastic. And uh, do they also change now? So are we on the next slide now? Uh, exactly, the next si uh, slide with Conseil European for la recherche nucléaire. Fantastic, I did that so you can say the French <laughs> stuff so I don't have to speak French because my French is outrageous. All right. Cool, fantastic, so that works, so let's get started. And of course, as Michael said, please, if there are any questions, to be honest, my goal is not to talk. I mean, of course I will talk and those who know me know that I love to talk, but my idea is really that I talk a little bit and then you get to bombard me with questions and I will hopefully be able to answer all of them so that you get exactly what you want. Because I have an idea of what I want to tell you, but if that is not fitting with what you have signed up for to join on an evening, presumably for most of us, uh, then let's make sure that it's useful for everyone, okay? So feel free to drop your questions in the chat and hopefully we will then um, get to all of them by the end of the session. All right, so CERN, as some or most of you might know, uh, CERN is a research laboratory, actually the largest particle physics laboratory in the world and CERN itself, the name is an acronym. So we use each of the letter uh, of a larger sentence or statement and the statement is as Michael already said Conseil Européen pour la Recherche Nucléaire and no worries this is really all the French you will hear from me uh, we can translate it into English then uh, the original title is about the um, similar to the European Council for Nuclear Research this is quite an old name already uh, by now we call it the European Center maybe or even the European Laboratory for particle physics. So as you can tell, the name that we still have in our you know, official name and the acronym is there, uh, we kind of changed it over time. And I will tell you in a second why we needed to change it over time. Uh, but before we do that, let's have a quick look at, or a quick summary of what is CERN actually doing? And uh, it's very easy to memorize. Uh, 
uh, you can take the acronym C-E-R-N from CERN and you can reuse or repurpose each of the letters uh, for one of our four main missions. So CERN really has four important things we have to do. And one of them is, you know, the C, it could stand for international collaboration because it brings together researchers and scientists and engineers from countries from across the world to do one thing and one thing only, and that is research. Uh, to do that, and to do it over many years and decades, of course, education is a really important part, meaning that the E in CEI and in CERN could also stand for education. And I will talk about education in a, in a minute. Um, the R, of course, I was not very creative there. It is fundamental research. This is what CERN is really all about. We conduct fundamental research in the field of particle physics. And the cool thing with fundamental research, meaning you know, at the forefront of human knowledge, if you want uh, to call it that way, uh, we constantly have to reinvent what we are doing. We, we, we have to invest into finding ways of building larger accelerators, better detectors, etc. And by doing so, we invent new technology, some of which uh, definitely helps our research, but some of it might even help our daily lives, because that's the beauty of fundamental research. Some some byproducts are bound to happen. And of course, I assume most, if not all of you already know that the probably most famous byproduct that we are known for is the internet, the World Wide Web that we now call the internet. It was really invented at CERN in no way so that we can now, you know, have a Zoom conference or that we can uh, in the evening look at cat pictures or stuff like this. No, 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 I mean, this is nice, but we at CERN, well, one at CERN, one guy at CERN, he invented it uh, to share research from one side to another, from one computer to the other, because that was not invented yet. So he had to invent the web, as he called it. And then over time, it became the worldwide web. So you see, this is what CERN is about. We are an international collaboration. We bring together scientists who are constantly trained and educated at CERN, at this unique laboratory. We do it so we can conduct fundamental research in the field of particle physics and from time to time, no, constantly we develop new technology that helps us in our research, but from time to time, this new research, uh, this new technology also comes into our daily lives. So that was just, you know, a very quick summary of what CERN is about. Uh, but of course, I will go in more detail. But before we go into detail what CERN is about today, I want to quickly summarize the history of CERN because after all, it's quite an old organization. And you will see once we go through the history, very briefly, of course, that there is a beautiful, uh, I would call it a success story. It's really a success story of humans on this earth. And I will tell you in a second what I mean. Because if you look at my slides, you see that 1949, quite long ago, uh, this is when everything started. We had the first steps towards civilian research in the field of nuclear technology. And if you recall, the Second World War had only ended a couple of years before that. And that is actually the reason why the first steps were taken because after uh, World War II, Europe was of course almost completely destroyed. It was a post-war scenario. Uh, the researchers who had been working within Europe uh, before both world wars, they uh, had to flee to the US or to other places in the north of Europe, for example, uh, because they could not live anymore, of course, during these war times. And so there was no research going on uh, in Europe. And most importantly, the new, the atomic bomb that was um, successfully developed, and you see me doing big quotation marks uh, when I do that, because successfully developed sounds really strange if we talk about a bomb that killed way too many people, of course, but successfully only, really only in terms of scientific terms, that we saw for the first time that this nuclear energy, which until then was really just a theoretical idea, is really real. And of course, it was used to kill way too many people, so it's not good. But we saw that there is something. So that's when a lot of Nobel Prize winning scientists suggested, hey, now that the war is finally over, let's create this center in Europe where we, where we start doing research. We bring back researchers closer to their homes. We start rebuilding Europe and we investigate nuclear energy, but clearly not for any kind of weapons or bombs, but really from a pure fundamental research, pure scientific uh, point of view. 
And so um, that, of course, is a huge step. I mean, just saying, hey, let's you know work together shortly after the war. So, but on a scientific level, that was possible back then, and it, it, it's still possible. So we see it in science that people can work together if they are focusing on you know finding out what nature is about. Then they tend to not really care about you know politics and 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 problems in our world um and so the slogan that was coined at the very beginning and that we still keep it soon is science for peace which to be honest sounds a little bit cheesy but it's really exactly what CERN is about and you can see why i'm smiling so much because it's really why i'm one of the main many reasons why i'm so happy to be working at CERN because we really bring together people from different countries sometimes countries where you know not the best connections between the countries but the people the researchers themselves they work next to each other. And I think, to be honest, that's what it's all about. We should, you know, overcome any kind of problems and just, you know, make the world a better place. All right, I'm, I'm very flourish, uh, very, uh, very nice sentences today, but it's really how I feel. So there we go. All right, so how does it continue then? Well, the first steps, there were a couple of meetings. And then in 1952, uh, under the auspices of UNESCO in Geneva, CERN was founded and we needed UNESCO, you know, as an official agency to really guarantee that this is not any kind of, you know, new war project or, or you know, a laboratory to create bombs. It's really a peaceful project. So we had this um, uh, guarantor. And then in 1953, the first 12 founding countries signed the so-called CERN Charter. CERN Charter, if you want, is the birth certificate of our organization. And you can kind of probably see, I will tell you, um, the, the number states, the first 12 founding states. You can see them on the image on my slides. So, well, you can see, hopefully you can see them, but I will read through uh, them because it's a little bit difficult to see. So the first is Germany, then we have Belgium, Denmark, France, Greece, Italy, and then on the other side, we have Norway, the Netherlands, Great Britain, Sweden, Switzerland, and back then the Republic of Yugoslavia, which of course today is the former Republic of Yugoslavia, and a lot of uh, countries from the former Republic of Yugoslavia are now, of course, attached to us but I will show you how it looks these days in a second. So these are the first 12 member states. You can already tell, you know, just having, you know, Germany and France and other countries on one list is already a huge achievement so close after the Second World War, uh, where probably diplomatically, there was not much connection going on between the two countries or the three, four countries, but on a scientific level, people could already work together. Um, and you can see that uh, for each of the countries, one scientist signed, or at least one scientist signed on behalf of their country. So you see for Germany, for example, you see, you might uh, read that this is the signature of Werner Heisenberg, who most, if not all of you might know from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, one of my very famous, uh, most favorite uh, scientists, to be honest, and he signed on behalf of Germany. So he was one of the founding fathers. Uh, but that meant that his signature was not necessarily legally binding. And so uh, you can see on my slides, the last step, it took another year from 53 until 54 until all the signatures by the scientists were really ratified and that the government said, yes, this is official. And then in 1954, we officially said, okay, now CERN is founded. And this is really the birth year of CERN. So you can see in 2024, we are ready for another big birthday celebration here at CERN. Hopefully by then, uh, pandemic will be way beyond uh, behind us and we will be able to properly celebrate it. And maybe, who knows, welcome some of you on our site because you know, if they and, and I think Jeff's connection is just Cut out for a second there. He, he warned me that the connection might be a little bit slow. So uh, let's benefit from this pause. Does anyone have any questions that they'd like to relay or ask while we're waiting for Jeff's connection to get back up? Was that me? Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah, your your connection cut out. So I was just saying if people have questions Shoot. while waiting for it to come back. But now if you're back, um, questions can keep going in the chat if anyone has any. Uh, I apologize. That was strange. Zoom really closed. Sorry. Um, when when did I kind of you know stop transmitting information? Uh, um, it, it was only like 
half a minute ago. You, you had already mentioned uh, about the signatures and 1954 being the, the, like the real start year, and then there might be a big celebration in two years. All right. Oh, okay, okay. So we didn't miss a lot. I apologize. I really well. Anyway, you know, you can see we invented the world of rap, <laughs> but it still can be unstable. I apologize. Okay, let's hope it doesn't con continue like this. Um, yeah. So birth here, but I feel like you know I, I don't have that much time uh, doing my presentation. I do not want to talk too much about history. I want to continue a little bit and tell you how it looks these days. And so uh, let's move on to. Oh, sorry, and, yeah. and, and can I interrupt you with a question? Because it seems like a good time because it's about the history as well. Alex is asking, has CERN ever changed purpose? Like what the Ooh. mission of it is? Ah, fantastic question. Thank you so much. I, uh, well, yeah, I can answer it right now. Um, very good question. So of course, uh, at the very beginning, uh, the focus was really as it's written in our name on nuclear research, meaning uh, back then 50, in the 50s, we knew about atoms. We knew that within atoms, there's a nucleus and they're around this, uh, our orbitals. And we knew that within the nuclear space, there were protons and neutrons that we already knew. But the fact that those protons and neutrons are made of even smaller particles, so-called quarks and gluons, that was not known. So back then, you know, the lowest level that we could go or that we can think of where was the nuclear space. So we call it nuclear physics. But then very shortly after, you know, a couple of years after CERN came into existence, we noticed, hey, there is at least one more step further down. So that's when we discovered quarks and gluons. And uh, these are what we now call elementary particles, meaning this is at the moment, our you know lowest level, but uh, we don't know. Maybe we we will find uh, there are some quarks which are really heavy. They have a lot of mass compared to the others, so maybe they are uh, also composite. We don't know. Anyway, long story short, at the beginning we really called it nuclear research, but then of course our research focus got wider and wider over time, and that's why we are now focusing on particle physics. But it was always fundamental research. So there was never, you know, research to, for applications or technology. This is just, these are just side products. It just happened. But for us, it's really fundamental research. All right. Very good question. Thank you for asking that. That fit perfectly well here. Yeah. All right. Uh, another question or should I continue? I, I think that's all the questions that have come up in the chat so far. Cool. Fantastic. All right. Let's hope Zoom will remain stable for me. So how does it look like these days? Well, as you can see on my slides here, um, we nowadays, you know, from the original 12 member states, we are now up to 23 member states plus another 10 associate member states. And I will tell you in a second what this distinction means. Um, so you can see them on uh, my slides. Um, the, these are all the countries that uh, provide funding for our organization. These days, you know, this is really the most important thing, who pays. Uh, so these countries, they are the ones who provide uh, the budget. And the budget, as you can see on my slides, is roughly 1.2 billion Swiss francs, which can be converted into euros. Rough, well, it's probably a little bit more than these days, but roughly 1.1 billion euros or 1.3 billion US dollars. Very important, we do not get you know, the sum of it. It's just I converted it for information. We do not get 1 billion here, 1 billion there. That would be beautiful. But of course, we are very happy that we get at least the 1.2 billion Swiss francs, which of course is a lot of money. I mean, un unless anyone is in the room who says, ah, that's not a lot of money. If that is the case, if anyone in the room says that's not a lot of money, please send me an email. I would love to meet you because if you think a billion francs or euros or dollars is not a lot of money, I would really love to know how you live your life and you know, if I can be part of it. <laughs> but I think we can all agree 1.2 billion Swiss francs, it's a lot of money. But of course, if it comes from 33 different countries and all of them pay a certain share according to their gross domestic product, then of course, then this overall sum is really feasible. It's really manageable, still a lot of money, but uh, overall for an organization like CERN, it's, we are happy that we get it, but we would not mind getting more but I think that is for the next couple of years, a little bit unrealistic. So we are happy that we stay at that level. And um, 
Uh, you are probably wondering why I put a coffee mug on my slides in the right hand lower corner. Well, that's just to give you an idea. If you if we sum up all the people who live in the member states and we divide the 1 billion Swiss francs, 1.2 billion Swiss francs by all the inhabitants of the member states, then roughly speaking, each one of them pays about uh, two Swiss francs or two euros per year, which of course can be converted into one cup of coffee. Uh, so you can see uh, it's a little bit of a cheap trick because if you divide a large number by a large number of people, then the outcome is small. But just to give you a, a perspective, it's really not that much money if it comes from all the different member states. And at CERN, I think not just at CERN, in science research overall, coffee is a really important thing so that's why it's our internal currency you know we do not calculate in swiss francs or euros or dollars we calculate in cups of coffees makes a little bit things a little bit easier and of course you know it's more closer to our hearts um so why do we call some countries member states and some other countries as social member states the reason are historically bound because at the very beginning uh cern was really a european center for nuclear research uh, but that was just because in the very beginning that was how it was conceived but as we grew older and larger we noticed it's really stupid to limit yourself to one continent if you you know if you want to be world leading and if you want to attract talent from around the world then you have to be as global as possible and of course also to give your research uh, instruments uh, to everyone from around the world you have to be as global as possible and so by now, uh, CERN is really no longer European. It's really the center of everywhere, as our former general director called it once. And uh, But of course, in the beginning, it was European. And that's why legally, we were not allowed when, for example, India or Pakistan joined, we were not allowed to call them member states because they are not European. So we you know, invented this trick that we call them as social member states. And this is now our way how we get more countries, even if they are within um, Europe or outside of Europe, they join us as social member states. And then some of them will effectively become uh, real, uh, like officially member states. For example, Croatia will become member states, Cyprus, they are all in the pre-stage. But for this purpose, for our evening now, it doesn't matter if they are member state or a social member state, they contribute to the budget, they have the same rights. So that is all that matters for now. And there will be more countries joining gladly. Uh, for example, uh, lately we have had very positive discussions with Brazil, which would then be the first South Africa, uh, South African, sorry, South American country joining soon. So that would be very exciting. And of course, hopefully there will be more. All right. I would talk and, and we have at oh, least yes, one teacher from Brazil here as well. So it's it's nice. good, uh, yeah. That's very good news then for uh, for this teacher because it might mean that uh, well at least some of your students in the future might be able to uh, work at CERN because clearly the most important thing is once there is a member state or you are from a member or a social member state you have the right to apply for jobs at CERN directly. There is also there are also some opportunities for non-member state uh, people, but it's way more difficult. So uh, good news for Brazil, once they join, it's still not, you know, cast in stone, but it looks very prompt. Anyway, uh, coffee. I talked about coffee and I talked about this cup of coffee. And of course, it's not just a cup. It's not just a mug. There is a big, beautiful formula on top of it. And uh, since we are all a room of nerds, and I mean nerd in the best way possible, uh, we are probably all you know, desperately trying to figure out what does this formula mean? And I can tell you it is the short, well, the, actually the ultra short version of the so-called Lagrangian. Lagrangian means the formalism mm -hmm. with which we describe, oh, I see some people happy in the, in, 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 in the Zoom, nice. Uh, it's Lagrangian, it's the, sh it's the version that we use to, it's the mathematical formalism that we use to describe this so-called standard model of particle physics. It's really, that encodes everything we know about particle physics. And uh, uh, that means we, that describes everything we know about the universe, except for gravity and some other stuff that we don't like to talk about because we don't know yet how it works. <laughs> but it, it describes a lot that we know. The formula itself, very difficult. The physics behind the formula, really, really difficult. I mean, this is quantum field theory. I'm not here to lie to you to say, ah, oh, that's easy. That's, it's not easy, but one can understand it. One has to 
spend time with it. One has to study it and uh, to make life a little bit easier, a little bit, not too much, but a little bit. Uh, me and some of my colleagues, we, a couple of years ago, we sat down and we said, okay, we want to explain each of the terms of the Lagrange. Like really, what does everything mean? F menu, what does it mean? And we wrote this paper uh, that we called, uh, let's have a coffee with the standard model of particle physics, because you know, the formula is in a coffee mug. And you can of course download this paper for free, it's open access. Uh, you can get it by our website, uh, CERN.ch slash PER, which stands for Physics Education Research, which we do at CERN. And uh, you can give it a go, but a fair bit of warning, it is not easy. I mean, we try to explain it as easily as possible, but it's still, you know, after all quantum field theory. But if you want to get it a go, please, by all means, have a look at it. And then this might be your entry point into studying physics later on, maybe. Who knows? But uh, so this is really what we know about uh, the universe with some exceptions and I will talk about them. But before we talk really about physics and I really want to speed up a, little, a bit so we get to the physics part, let me just tell you, uh, let me paint you a picture how CERN really looks like because we did see member states, associate member states, but as I said, CERN by now is as global as possible at the moment. And you can see CERN brings together more than 20,000 scientists from really around the world, almost all countries around the world. You see on this world map, let's not figure, uh, let's not focus too much on the different colors. Uh, these are just different statuses, member states, associate member states, or contractual agreements, whatsoever. The important message is whenever a country has some kind of color penciled in, be it dark blue, light blue, gray, um, that means they have connections with CERN one way or another. And the only countries who are not yet connected to CERN, uh, you can see uh, most of them are in Central Africa. Uh, then we have some in Southeast Asia and also Central America. So these are still countries where we are still actively working to, you know, uh, increase our connections and then over time, uh, maybe see with the government if it makes sense for them to join. Of course, not every government has interest in joining CERN because if they do not have any kind of research that CERN is doing back at their home, there is no need of you know paying money and then not being able to send scientists or engineers from their country. So it's really, it, it takes a bit, but I hope over time, the, you know, for the next 10 years that we are now running this virtual science camp, because I think Michael, that's your plan, right? We will go for 10 years at least. So in 10 years from now, uh, I will give the same talk, but I hope that the map will have changed. I will hopefully not give the same talk. That would be really sad. <laughs> but it's, it's um, such a good talk. You shouldn't change it. <laughs> I do want to change, you know, I want to upgrade it at least. All right, but thank you. Um, and uh, just to give you some numbers, uh, so you see them on my slides, um, there, uh, out of the 20,000 people who are attached to CERN, only about 4,000 something are really, you know, based and then, and, well, based, employed by CERN. So these are those 2,600 staff. So I'm one of those staff scientists. Uh, then we have 800 fellows, which are postdoctoral researchers, and another roughly 550 students. So PhD students, master students who are really at CERN, but these are, as you can count up, I mean, just four, four, five thousand people, and then the majority are those fifteen thousand users who really come to CERN for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. Some of them are permanent uh, to use our facilities because, after all, what CERN really does is we provide accelerated particles. That's all we do, and we accelerate particles, uh, and then you know, experimental collaborations can ask us to smash those particles against each other so they can then investigate what happens. So this is really, we at CERN, we just accelerate the particles and other collaborations who send their scientists to CERN, they use our facilities to then investigate what happens. And as you can see, we then have another 2,000-ish externals. So these are technicians and of course, facility managers and uh, what have you not, because we are a really large organization. And uh, what do we do? Well, oh, and, and just for later. Oh, sorry. Yes, please. Yeah. Can I interrupt with another question? Maybe two. Please. So, so there was one that, that was related to what you were saying about the different users, and it's do you have partnerships with universities? All right. Very good. Um, uh, we almost exclusively have partnerships with universities. So it's not, you know, individuals. 
Um, it's, so if, for example, if we have a cooperation agreement with a certain country, then this country nominates a certain country delegate and they then facilitate the exchange between the university and CERN. So certain particle physics institutes, uh, they will have to then nominate people who they can send to CERN. So it's really via the universities almost exclusively or other research laboratories for example, you mentioned uh, the Joint Institute of Nuclear Research in Russia. These are really our main uh, partners in the uh, in Russia, and uh, yeah, but mostly universities. And and then there was another question uh, that I didn't interrupt you to ask a while ago. Uh, that the U.S. paid two billion dollars to CERN in nineteen ninety seven. Aren't they a member? Very good question. Uh, US, as you can see on this current slide, uh, is penciled in with this light blue, same as Russia and Japan, for example. These are the so-called observer states. Um, as I said, it's just a contractual difference, but observer states, this was important when we built the LHC end of the 90s, so the currently largest accelerator in the world. And uh, US and Russia and Japan as non-member states, they said, hey, we still have a huge community in particle physics. We want to be a part of it. So they paid a certain amount to be observers, meaning that they could observe whatever happens at CERN and send people there. But uh, we could not make the member or a social member state because back then, you know, we still had to figure out legal uh, issues. At the moment, they are still called observer states, but there were no new observer states. So this was really just something that we did during the period of LAC. And it's something that we try to phase out now over time. And who knows, uh, depending on the future of CERN, uh, US might join as an associate member state in the future. But I think at the moment, there is no interest uh, from this side. At least as far as I know. All right. Uh, should I continue or is there another question? Uh, there's there's a couple of comments, but I, I think we're doing good to continue for now. Very good. All right. Then, as I said, what do we do at CERN? I mean, I said, you know, we accelerate particles and uh, we investigate particle physics, but what do we really do? Well, what we really do is we try to answer the fundamental questions of humankind. And the human, the really fundamental questions, um, you know, we did not invent them. We stole them from the ancient Greeks. And uh, then a French painter, he also stole them from there and he put it back on the back of one of his paintings. So, and now we just, you know, we reuse them as well. Because this thing is fundamental questions, somehow they never change, which is good. Uh, so the fundamental questions are, where do we come from? Uh, which we, of course, try to answer with the Big Bang Theory, not the sitcom, although uh, still a lot of fun to watch it. But uh, we, of course, talk about the real theory uh, that describes that 13.8 billion years ago, something happened. And then uh, the Big Bang essentially created everything that we now observe in the universe. And it developed over time. And that now brings us to our current state in, on our beautiful planet Earth. Uh, and we try to figure out how that could have happened, not necessarily what happened in the moment of the Big Bang, because in the moment of the Big Bang, time was also created. So there is no, you know, what happened before, the question we cannot ask, uh, but what happened very closely after uh, uh, Big Bang, that's a big important question to us and how did the universe then develop itself? So that's the big question. Then what are we made of? This is really particle physics in itself. So we describe everything being made of elementary particles that interact via fundamental interactions, but, as I said, for example, the gravitational force, we cannot explain gravity in terms of quantum field theory. It just doesn't work. We have beautiful explanations thanks to Albert Einstein. Thank you for that. But we cannot combine the two theories yet. We might do that if we might find, you know, uh, the associated particle, if there ever is one, uh, and we might find other particles to explain other phenomena that we still cannot explain yet. But for now, we have our standard model of particle physics, which is very nice and very nicely complete, and we hate it for it. Don't get me wrong, we love our standard model of particle physics, but it's just so beautiful, but it's closed. And we cannot, you know, we don't have, an, uh, we haven't found yet a way how to expand it to, for example, explain gravity. And uh, we also have 
well, not so much ideas about where are we going? So what is the universe really doing? Is it continuing to expand like hell as it do, as it's doing at the moment? Will it stop at some point? Will it come back? We do not know. And if you look in the universe, we see a lot of stuff that we at the moment call dark matter. And that's probably the best we can do at the moment. We have a name for it. It's called dark matter, but we don't really know whether it's, you know, matter in the sense that we think of matter, like stuff that we can touch. We know for sure it interacts gravi uh, via gravitation, uh, but we, it doesn't interact via electromagnetic um, interaction. So it's strange and we do not really have, we have ideas, but we really have to test them. So there are a lot of open questions within, within all the three categories which is, I hope, really good news for every one of uh, you in the room. Because if you ever think just of a slight idea of having a career in particle physics, maybe in the future, I promise you, and I guarantee you, we will leave a lot of those questions unanswered just for you. We are very kind, you know, we leave them to you. You can go and collect all your Nobel Prizes that you want, because I'm afraid we will not solve all of those questions within the next couple of years. We are very kind, we leave that to you. No, I think the message should be the other way around. We really need you. So if particle physics is just something for you, please go to university, study something related to particle physics or engineering or whatever STEM subject suits you. And then we hope to see you soon at CERN and help us explain the universe. If you come to CERN, you would then see this beautiful area. I love this image so much to show you a little bit how it looks like at CERN. So you see the beautiful town of Geneva with the beautiful lake of Geneva. In the back, you see a lot of mountains and the highest peak of those mountains is Mont Blanc, the highest mountain on continent, continent of Europe. Uh, you can see the airport of Geneva right here with the quite large runway of almost four kilometers in length. And that already gives you a little bit of a, a size uh, reference for the whole area. And of course, what springs into your eyes the moment you see this image is this big, big yellow circle, which of course is the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, the largest accelerator in the world, not just the largest, also the most powerful. This is a conference of almost 27 kilometers. You can, of course, not see it if you look at uh, the area from in real world because we did not build it on the ground. That would be really impractical having such a big building on the ground. We build it roughly 100 meters underground. And uh, you can see here in this triangular shaped area, uh, this is where our main site is located. Uh, it says here Cern Marin because the village around is called Marin. And we have here another small village called Prefsin and close to it is our second air main site of Cern. The most important thing for me to point out is yes, the Large Hadron Collider is clearly the largest, the most powerful, the best accelerator in the world. It's the one that we are most famous for, but it is not the only one. That's really important because we not only have the one, we have a lot of accelerators. And that brings me to the next slide to show you how CERN really looks like. Ah, oh, look at this beautiful slide. I like this slide so much. I personally, I could talk about that for the next two hours. I will not do that. I have to at some point bring my daughter to bed, but uh, we could, you know, maybe at some point schedule another session to explain a little bit more all our accelerators. But for now, I want to just leave you with the message that at CERN we have what you see here, a big accelerator chain. So really different accelerators connected to each other, because if we want to accelerate particles to the highest energies possible, we cannot do it with one machine because each machine, each accelerator can only you know, accelerate particles from a certain energy to a certain maximum energy. Uh, it's similar to in a car, the gear shift, you, you know, we, you start with first gear, then second, then third, and that's how you then accelerate further. Very similar concept to our accelerators. And so at CERN, we have a big chain. And the cool thing with this chain is that each of those accelerators has, as I said, a certain maximum energy that they can reach. And that means we can use the particles not only to, you know, constantly accelerate them all the way up to the LHC, but we can then also extract particles. For example, you see here the booster, just as an example, it's one of our accelerators, low energetic compared to the LHC. And we can take the particles either into the next larger accelerator, which is, as you can see here, called PS, 
or we can extract those particles already here and then send those particles into this research area, which is called Isolder, because they have to look at, they do a lot of uh, research with isotopes. And so for that, they do not need really, really high energetic particles because that would be really bad because with isotopes, you know, you want to have particles very close to the binding energy uh, of, of the particles in atoms. And so you want to have rather low energetic particles. And so that's why we can extract particles either after each accelerator or we shoot them into the next one. So it's really cool. And as I said, I could talk about this chain itself oh, for hours. I don't want to do that. Uh, but if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and I will try to answer them. But uh, as I said, we are, I would call us a service provider. We provide accelerated particles that at the end can then be used by research collaborations to investigate stuff with it. And for that, uh, we, um, uh, we need experiments. But I see Michael has probably a question for me, or at least he wanted to do something. So please. Yeah, yeah there's, uh, thank you. There, there's two or three questions that have come up into the, uh, into the chat. All right, um, let's go for it. So I'll, I'll say all three and then you can answer them in whatever order. Uh, how will the future circular collider fit into the image? Uh, how long has the LHC been active and why is it not now functional? And is a pi on a gluon? <laughs> These are amazing questions. I love it. I love it. Um, all right, let me go through it. First question was, how does a future accelerator would fit into this image? The answer is very simple. It doesn't. I mean, it won't fit into the image because it would be too large. Um, a future accelerator, if we ever build it at CERN, not decided yet, we will have to see, uh, it would need to be connected to the LHC. So we would need the currently most powerful accelerator, the LHC, to then accelerate particles to the currently highest energies. And then we would extract those particles and feed them into another accelerator that would then maybe, you know, if it's ever being built, depends on the next couple of years. It would have probably a circumference of about 100 kilometers. And you can see that would not fit onto the slide anymore. So, um, uh, but that would happen. Uh, so that was the first question. Um, uh, but I will, I will come to the future in, at the end of my talk. So I will talk a little bit more about that. Um, what was the second question? I forgot the, the one. Uh, how long has the LHC ah, been active? And thank why you, is it and not why is it now not functional? That is a very good question. I love it. Thank you. Well, on my slide, you can see here the LSC. It says here 2010. That's not, um, uh, I mean, that's the correct time since when we really use it. We switched it on a little bit earlier, but um, at the beginning, we had one mechanical fault in one of our many, many connections, and that led to quite a nice um, chaos. So part of the accelerator, unfortunately, um, um, uh, there was a small explosion within this connection and it imploded and that uh, caused a delay of 14 months. But then since 2010, we have been operational with the LHC, but with such a large machine, we can usually only run for about three years. And then after three years, we have to take a break of about two years to do maintenance, but also to upgrade stuff. Because obviously, you know, while you're running three years, technology really changes. And if you can make things more efficient, more powerful, well, then you better change it during those two years. And so that's why we usually give or take, we run three years, we have a break of two years. We run three years, we have a break of two years. And now with Corona, we have a slight delay, uh, but at the moment, so Corona hit us exactly during one of our so-called lung shutdowns, which was supposed to be two years. It's now almost two and a half years, but uh, spring this year, we will switch on our machines and we will start again for another, at least three, uh, almost three years of running. When I say three years, it's of course not running nonstop, but if you're really running full steam ahead, we would have uh, uh, acceleration, 12, 14 hours every day, then a short stop of one, two hours, and then another 12, 13 hours. So it's really in that over days, if not weeks. So we are very busy, uh, but um, uh, at the moment we are still, you know, uh, closing the machine, finishing the last bits of our maintenance and, and upgrades. And then spring around Easter, we are probably going to switch on if everything works. And then uh, there's one last question, is the pion a gluon? Uh, I can tell you no, because the pion itself is uh, a type of particle itself. It's different from a gluon, but the question is very good because in the very beginning, uh, the pion was kind of used in a theory 
uh, comparable to a gluon. So a gluon is the particle, it's an infection particle that mediates the strong force that holds together the, the quarks uh, to then form protons and neutrons, for example. Um, and, uh, but of course we know that protons and neutrons themselves, they stick, they stick together within the nuclear space of atoms. And uh, the interaction to keep them together, in the very beginning, it was described as a pion uh, interaction. So the pion was described as the interaction particle, but pions themselves are made of quarks. And so uh, essentially what happens is that quarks form together and they then wobble to each other and, and keep protons and neutrons together but uh, uh, pions are not gluons that I can say. All right. And, and, and yes, it's, it's not another question, but just on the topic of the LHC shutdown, that actually works really well for virtual tours of different parts of it because you, it, no one can go down. Well, there, there's a lot more access or like Atlas is open and you can see the inside when there's not the beam line running. Uh, so those who joined uh, for the virtual visits last year, we got to see inside of them. And we'll be going probably in another two weeks. Uh, Steve at Atlas is going to be showing us around there again. Um, nice. So just mentioning that because the related to the shutdown. So hopefully everyone co will come for the, the virtual tour of the Atlas detector. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. By all means, definitely sign up for that. Steve is awesome. Atlas is awesome and this visit is going to be awesome. And it's true. Uh, it's an opportunity that we will then not be able to offer uh, for the next couple of years because while we are running, it's really difficult to uh, uh, to go to get people downstairs. I mean, of course, you know, people have to go downstairs to do maintenance and stuff, but then it's unlikely that they will do a visit. So yes, <laughs> sign up for that. It's a unique opportunity. And um, and uh, virtually it's even more impressive because you see a little bit more, more than if you were to go underground, which of course is awesome, but uh, you see a little bit more with the cameras. So uh, sign up for that. How are we doing for time, Michael? What is the time? It's uh, six fifty three. Nice. That is not too bad. I was I was fearing that it would be later. Very good. All right. Um, if, of course, as I said, I could talk about the accelerator chain for a long time. We can discuss questions a little bit later as well. But if you want to read a little bit about how it works, well, I have good news for you because a couple of years ago, friends of mine, uh, mine and colleagues of mine, uh, we together wrote a paper uh, entitled uh, Introducing the LHC in the Classroom. You can see it's more directed to teachers, but it's perfectly fine to read uh, by students as well. And we really just in very easy terms explain how the LHC, how the whole accelerator chain works, what is required. And we also link it to the physics curriculum so that students and teachers can see um, uh, how the accelerator chain of CERN connects to uh, the standard physics curriculum. It's a really nice paper. It's a little bit old, but now I think we published in 2016, but not many things have changed. So I can still confidently uh, encourage you to have a look at it. Of course, we published it open access. It certainly published everything open access. Uh, it's within our mission to really make sci our research results available to humankind. And so you can go on our website, cern.ch slash PER, stands for Physical Education Research, and download this paper and have a go at it. It's definitely easier to read than the last paper advertised with quantum field theory. That is really tough. This one, I think um, it's, it's easier. All right. Um, so and, and talk, can I interrupt oh, yes, you with one more question that please. came through about the reactor chain? So uh, the accelerator it's, chain. Uh, sorry, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, where, where where does the chain start? And I think it's changing for when they put it back online, right? Don't they have a new Linux? Absolutely, yeah. You can see so very good question. Um, where does it start? Well, there are actually two entrance entry points. Uh, just give me a second to move everything around. So um, there are two entry points. Uh, you have one line starts here where it says Linux 4, and we have another one where it says Linux 3. And you can see from the dates that uh, Linux 3 has been running since 1994. But as Michael, you just pointed out correctly, uh, Linux 4 only, we, we, we got it operational uh, 2020, beginning of the pandemic. It's a stupid time to get an accelerator operational during a pandemic, but we got it. And uh, we will now for the very first time switch it on, you know, like really connected to the accelerator chain. Now when we restart everything, why do we have two entry points? Well, uh, within our accelerator chain, we can accelerate two different types of particles. And the one are protons. This is really our core business. 
and this is what Linux 4 is used for. We accelerate, um, uh, this is to create protons. And with Linux 3, you can see here, we can create ions to be precise, a lead ions, because about a month every year, we not only collide protons and protons, but we also collide lead ions with lead ions. Or if we really feel, or not just feel, you know, funny, but if we want to investigate properly, we can even collide protons with lead ions, or probably the other way around, we can collide lead ions with protons. And that's why we need to have two different entry points into this accelerator chain. All right. I hope this answers uh, this question. And of course we can talk about accelerators more, but I do want to do the whole business of CERN a little bit more justice by telling you a little bit more uh, about what we do with our accelerated particles. Because as I said, we provide them, but then huge uh, detector collaborations uh, use them to study what happens if, for example, they collide. Because with accelerated particles, you can really only do two things. You can either smash them against each other or you smash them against the target, a wall, a piece of metal. These are the only two things that you can do. And we do both of them at CERN. Uh, and at the LHC, we really smash them against each other. And uh, in this image, you can see Atlas, we just mentioned. Uh, I chose it because it's the largest particle detector at CERN. And uh, you can tell from the image right here it's really the largest uh, because you see here on the image, we, uh, this was during construction, it's not completed yet. Uh, during construction time, we placed a standardized French technician in there. They are all two meters high. That's very easy for us to then uh, estimate how large everything is. And you can see that the Atlas detector has, uh, it, the height is about 26 meters and its depth is 46 meters. It's incredibly large and, um, uh, and that's why uh, this virtual visit with Atlas, if you have a chance <clears throat> to join it, please do so because it's it's just a marvelous piece of engineering and uh, it's beautiful. But as I said, it was not completed yet to, when this picture was taken. And hopefully this French technician, he moved out of the way because then the inner parts of the detectors were moved inside because you can see our particle detectors, we always, you know, very carefully we, or lovingly, we compare them to high technological onions. Uh, so they have different layers from the inside to the outside, uh, because what we use them for is in the center of those particle detectors, we collide particles and in those collisions, new particles are created and they move outwards. And depending on the different kinds of particles, some of them then make it through the first layer, the second, some of them make it all the way outside. I will show you an image of how that looks like. So here, this is an image of how the Atlas detector then would uh, detect uh, collisions. Of course, we do not you know, look at those images, but we do produce them to just check is everything working properly. But of course, to analyze the data, we just get a lot of zeros and ones uh, because those collisions as we see them or this collision as we see it here on my screen, they happen roughly now about a billion times per second, yes. Isn't that crazy? A billion times per second. I mean, I cannot imagine that. I'm just happy to memorize this number, um, but that's why our detectors are so amazing. They can really detect and analyze, essentially analyze what happens in those collisions immediately, instantaneously. And you see here, some particles make it to the first layer, to the second layer, to the third layer. Some particles make it all the way outside. And just by that, we already know what kind of particle it is. But by moving through the different layers of the detectors and moving through a strong magnetic field that is placed within each of the particle detectors, we can then measure the properties of those particles. And that's how the detectors then give us the numbers. No human being could ever, would ever be able to just, you know, even analyze it. I mean, of course we could take a look at the image and then carefully analyze it but why we do that we miss trillions or even billions of trillions of um, uh, collisions in the process because every second we get a billion of collisions so we are very grateful that we have computers by now to do that and if you um, uh, want to investigate or figure out for yourself how this magnetic system that uh, this uh, Atlas detector, for example, has, as I said, each particle detector has a magnetic field, a very strong magnetic field that we use to uh, curve the 
tracks of the particles, of the electrically charged particles, um, which is not very easy to understand, uh, meaning that this magnetic field of the atlas detector, well, a little bit difficult to imagine. It's a, it's a little bit, it's difficult, but it's very easy to understand if you build it on your own, because you can build the magnetic system of the atlas detector at home, no worries, not 46 meters long, 26 meters high, that's a little bit unpractical, but you can do it in a nice version, I believe the ratio is one to 100, I believe, or one to 1000, depends, you do the math, <laughs> uh, and you can 3D print it. Um, I see Ma Michael is already doing the math. He will tell us in a second if it's one to 100 or one to 1000. Uh, oh. I would estimate it's 46 centimeters long. What is that to 46 meters? Yeah, no, that, that works out to one to 100. I, uh, what yeah. I was <laughs> reflecting on was how big it was when I tried to make it. And I, I think it might've been slightly smaller than that. So maybe one to 150, but I, I could be completely wrong on that. That's perfectly fine. The, the ratio doesn't matter as long as you do not build it one to one, unless your living room is that large. In that case, again, send me a message. I would love to see your living room if you can fit the atlas detector inside of it. Um, as you can see, um, you can 3D print it. Yes, these are really 3D printable files. If you have access to a 3D printer, well, there goes your weekend uh, project um, because you can then really, you know, wire up those coils. You need eight coils made out of copper wire. You can solder them together. If all of that sounds too exhausting to you, well then invite your physics teacher or science teacher to do it as a project in the classroom because of course all these materials are available online not just the materials to download but also a nice documentation and if you don't want or if you don't uh, you cannot 3d print well then we also have documentation how you can do it even lower cost with some cardboard and some straws or some other stuff so it's really really easy to do because one of our big aims is to make education and especially experiments as cheap as possible not yet as cheap as michael and his fantastic project are but you know we are getting there and so I just, you know, I encourage you again to check out our website where we have a lot of ideas for classroom activities that you can, of course, also do at, in your living room. Um, and um, so I just have, uh, as an example, the Atlas model, but another example, a little bit more advanced. So this is clearly something where I suggest that you invite your physics teacher to help you because you do need a little bit of electronics, unless, you know, you are proficient, then by all means, go ahead. This is a particle trap. I'm not kidding. You can build your own particle trap. I mean, you could technically buy those. You can buy them in shops for, you know, school equipment. They cost about 5,000 francs. That's really expensive, so don't do that. Instead, go to our website and download the files to 3D print them. Then with all the electric, uh, electronic components, it will cost you maybe 30, 40 francs or euros, you know, whatever currency you wanna use. So really, really considerably cheaper. And then you see here on my slides, the image that we took with a cell phone and you can really trap dust spores or uh, cinnamon powder, for example. Uh, and you can really see it with your bare eyes. It's amazing. And these particle traps, we call them Paul traps, uh, they are really used at CERN and we use them uh, for our antimatter research because if we create anti-atoms, we really have to make sure that they do not touch the walls of this trap because as most of you know, if we have an anti-atom and it meets an, uh, an atom, well, they annihilate and they transform into photons and release energy in that way. And so it's really difficult to study them unless you trap them in a field, uh, in this case, a mixture of electric and magnetic fields, but uh, this Paul trap here only uses electric fields. And so for the teachers in the rooms, um, uh, in the room, please have a look at it and uh, try it out. This, this will really significantly increase your uh, classroom because it will be very cheap to have a working Paul trap in your classroom. And for all the students in the room, this is, um, a project maybe for a couple of weekends. And if you don't feel at ease with it, involve your physics teachers, they should definitely know about it. Uh, and I'm not advertising it because we sell it. It's of course for free. I just love this experiment so much. And if you check it out, you will see what I mean. All right. And um, uh, one last advertisement, just because it was brand new from one of our fantastic um, uh, PhD students. And clearly this is not you know, an easy toy to play with. This is a proper, linear accelerator uh, that of course doesn't accelerate you know protons it's still uh, it's a model it accelerates 
a steel ball or an aluminum ball, but it really works. It's powered by an Arduino. So it's really a nice project to, for all scientists in the room who are looking for you know, a larger project. There is it uh, for all, uh, whoops, something. Um, oh, sorry, ha, I, um, yeah, I did something wrong. I, on my slides that I will share, of course, with you. Um, uh, I, oh, oh, sorry. Um, I have the links to it and I clicked on the link and that was stupid. So um, the link to our website, cern.ch slash PR, as always, you find all our stuff there. So please check it out. And there's way more. I stopped this advertisement session now because that's not what it's all about, but I just wanted to mention a couple of new things. Um, now, CERN, as I said, brings or develops new technology. Some of it uh, helps our research or all of it helps our research. Some of it makes its way to our daily lives. The World Wide Web, I think I mentioned many times now, thanks to it, we can have this fantastic virtual science camp all together with people from across the world. And uh, that's why for the World Wide Web, Google at some point when we switched on the LHC for the first time, they were kind enough to have us on the starting page. You can see that was a couple of years ago because this <laughs> image looks very old now. The touch screens, one of the first versions of the touch screen was invented at CERN. Again, not so we can now, you know, swipe left and right or zoom in or out. It was invented for one of our accelerators as a control panel because you would otherwise need a lot of buttons and that's not practical. So uh, the first guy uh, came up with it in his own workshop in his garage at home. He presented it at CERN. People said, yeah, let's build it. Uh, and over time, uh, it got better and, of course, more advanced. And since CERN publishes everything, well, the first um, uh, touchscreen, uh, the, the plans for it were also published. And then a lot of people around the world used it. And now we have our nice smartphones and, you know, uh, tablets and what have you not. Uh, so that's what we do at CERN. We invent stuff and it helps us. And if it helps humankind, well, even better. Last but not least, one uh, knowledge transfer that I'm hoping nobody in the room will ever have to use it. But uh, statistics tells us that uh, this might be the case. So it's good that we are prepared. These are medical applications, medical applications of particle physics. These are really important, for example, to treat tumors, not all tumors, unfortunately, but especially those tumors that are very difficult to operate on. So uh, if you have, for example, a tumor in your head, uh, somewhere close to your brain or maybe behind your eyes, very difficult to operate, but it's very easy, well, easy, still a huge, huge endeavor, but it's easier to use accelerated particles to treat this tumor, not all of them, unfortunately. And of course, the moment you have, uh, if it spreads in your body, then uh, even radiation will not uh, be very successful, unfortunately. So that's why detection is the key to uh, a very good uh, cancer prevention, meaning scanning for cancer cases. And here we also use particle detectors very similar to Atlas, just very, very smaller. Uh, like for example, a PET scan, if you've heard about that, the pos uh, positron emission tomography, um, that is essentially a particle detector as we use it at CERN, as, as you know, particle physics research labs in the past decades have developed them. And then people use this knowledge and uh, further it into hospitals. And so I hope nobody will ever have to use it, but if that is the case, well then, uh, accelerated particles can be used to treat tumors and of course our particle detectors can use to detect them in the first place. So um, yeah, not the nicest knowledge uh, transfer, but it's a, definitely a very relevant one. So I definitely wanted to mention it. Now, we already talked about it a little bit, uh, but uh, the question was already in the room. So I think it's only fair that I finish my presentation and then we have time for questions with the question, what's next? So I have, this image for you, because you asked how would a future circular collider fit on my slide? And you can see, well, it, it wouldn't, uh, but it would fit on this slide. Again, this is not yet decided. This is really just, we are still exploring whether it's feasible to build such a machine. So the LSC at the moment is foreseen to run until roughly 2040-ish, maybe 2042, something like this. But by then we will definitely be at the end of the LHC because in the current way, it will have uh, reached its maximum potential. So we will not be able to increase the energy. Then of course, there's an idea of uh, replacing the magnets within the LHC 
at the end of 2040 with newer magnets, hoping or assuming that we will have developed more powerful uh, magnets by then, uh, because then with the same circumference, but with stronger magnets, we could reach even higher energies. So that would already be a step. And of course, it would be a little bit cheaper compared to building such a huge 100 kilometer circumference uh, accelerator. But clearly, if we go for a larger circumference and we use those very powerful magnets that we will have developed by then, well, then we can significantly increase the energy that we can reach with the particles. And that would, of course, then be a game changer um, for the future. But clearly, this is very expensive. It's a huge project. So at the moment, what we are doing is a very, very professional pro uh, process where we have a feasibility study that is really investigating, is it possible? I mean, a good friend of mine, he's doing his PhD to just see how can we dig such a tunnel and not just how we dig it, but what do we do with the stuff that we dig out? Because clearly, you know, you have to dig out a lot of stone. Where do you park it? Where do you place it? That's a huge project and he's doing a PhD on that. That's really cool. And um, so um, uh, this might be the future, but of course, uh, in the end, we might decide it's not feasible or that it's too expensive uh, that we will decide in the next couple of years. Uh, let me show you uh, one image. This is how it looks like within the LHC at the moment. So this is inside the Large Hadron Collider. You can kind of see how this machine turns around the corner in the in the in the well in the distance, uh, because it has a circumference of 27 kilometers. And uh, if you want to work down there, and uh, you know there are only 12 access points, so 12 elevators going underground. Chances are that you might have to, you know, walk for, well, maybe two or three kilometers until you reach the location where you want to do something. And that's why we have bikes down there. I'm not kidding. We have a nice bike um, rack down there where with your access card, you rent your car, uh, your bike, and then you go ding, ding, and then you ride your bike for two or three kilometers. Um, or uh, you take an electric scooter if you have to transport some heavy equipment. And so that's how it looks like underground. Now, if we imagine that we built such a large future circular collider, which of course we would then uh, start, we would need to start building very soon. So hopefully the decision will be taken in the next couple of years. If it's a yes, well, fantastic, then all steam ahead. So that in time for when the LSC stops, 2040-ish, that we are ready with the future circular collider. But then there will be many, many problem, uh, problems or, or challenges in front of us. One of them, and I'm just mentioning it for you, because clearly if one of you is interested and we decide to build the future circular collider, that might be a fantastic workplace for you. And this workplace might look like this. Don't worry, this is not how it looks like. We haven't built it yet. I stole that from the internet. I just Googled accelerator. And I think it's from a movie. I don't even know. <laughs> but this is more realistic because you don't really see a curvature anymore because with 100 kilometers, it's really large, uh, but clearly, if you then go underground there and you want to go to the place where you want to work, it will not be two or three kilometers. It will be, I don't know, 20 kilometers. And so riding a bicycle will not be, I mean, I mean, it will be nice, but at the end of it, whew, you will be exhausted. So we clearly have to think of how we, how we you know, transport people underground. So that in itself will be a research project, not to speak of all the research we are doing with this machine, so I'm always telling students, and so I'm also now telling you, if we ever decide, well, no matter if we decide if you build this new accelerator, or if you uh, upgrade the LSC, we will definitely, and I promise you, we will need the next generation of scientists and engineers, for sure, because we have so many open questions. And so I'm really, really glad and grateful that Michael invited me to talk at uh, this fantastic event today again, because having so many excited people and, and interested people from around the world or from different countries in one room who care about particle physics is the best sign ever. And if some of you, clearly not all of you, I mean, unless all of you are really interested in it, but I don't want to, you know, force anyone. But if some of you feel like, yeah, physics, that could be for me. Well, I can only invite you to study physics. It's a wild ride. You will need a lot of patience because not everything is you know ah, <laughs> I understand it but I promise you if you study and you reach those points where you understand stuff ah this feeling is so good and so we really need you so uh, we need the next generation to just explain to us or figure out how we transport people underground how to build the tunnel how to build the machine and what we do with it so with that thank you so much for your attention 
Thank you so much for logging in into yet another Zoom webinar. I hope we will be at the end of this pandemic very soon so that we all get to see each other again, you know, in the real world. And I'm now looking forward to answering any of your questions you may have. I hope I will be able to answer them. And thank you again for your attention. Well, this, is, this has been excellent. Uh, thank you again, Jeff. Uh, just just before I start relaying some of the questions to you, you, you told me you wanted me to tell you when it's uh, if we get to quarter past seven and to cut you off completely then. It's yeah. 716. Do you still want to take a couple of questions or do you need to go right now? Well, uh, let's quickly go through some questions, but I definitely will have to go now uh, soon because I have a seven month old daughter <laughs> and I, uh, you know, as much as I love talking to you, don't take it the wrong way. I love uh, playing with my daughter before she goes to bed a little bit more, just a little bit. All right, questions, let's go so, through it. So on that note, we'll apologize if there's any questions we don't get to. I'll relay two or three and you decide if you want to answer all of them or some. So one is if you can smash and destroy particles, can you rebuild them? Uh, what's going to be the energy in the new tunnel? Uh, What's the current maximum uh, maximum energy now? Is it seven uh, uh, tera, tera electron volts? Uh, wouldn't it be easier to shift the uh, where the nuclear uh, accelerator is to not build it under the lake and mountains? And why in Switzerland in the first place? Awesome. All right. Uh, first question was, I think if we collide particles and destroy them, which is a little bit of a, it's true, we destroy them, but we do not, you know, they do not vanish, they transform into other particles. So uh, we can definitely um, uh, create any kind of particles that, you know, that exist by colliding particles, because what happens in the collision is that the energy of the collision is transformed into new particles. And uh, uh, that's, of course, because Albert Einstein told us that E equals mc squared, so energy equals mass. And so with energy, we can create mass, we can create, you know, in the form of particles. So clearly, the first question is answered. Yes, we can create new particles. That's exactly what we do in collisions. And what, why we do it is we then see what kind of particles are created, with what kind of properties, because if that is in alignment with our theory, well, okay. But if it's in disagreement, it means we have to change our theory. That's what we want ultimately, because then we can explain more stuff. I've forgotten all the other questions already. You will have to start again. Uh, what's the maximum energy proposed for the new accelerator? And what's the current maximum energy nice. in the LSC? Very good question. So at the moment in the LSC, the design energy is still seven tera electron volts per beam, uh, meaning a collision uh, energy of 14 tera electron volts. We have not ever reached that kind of energy at the moment. Before the shutdown, we were at 6.5 on 6.5, so 13 overall. And I believe we are now, the plan is to restart with, I'm not kidding, 6.75 on 6.75. So total of 13.5, I believe that will be the start, you know, give and take. Uh, and eventually over the next years, um, the Large Hadron Collider will be upgraded. And at some point we will definitely, well, we are aiming to reach seven on seven. In the new accelerator, you know, again, if we ever get to building it, it's not decided, um, we would uh, reach a collision energy of uh, roughly 100 tera electron volts. So uh, factor 10-ish uh, we would gain, which would really be a significant increase. So that would justify it. I believe one question that I remember was, why would we build it then not somewhere else? And why would why do we want to build it underneath the, the lake and with all the mountains? And a very good question. Well, the short answer is we already have our accelerator chain. And as I told you in the very beginning, we cannot just build a new accelerator somewhere uh, because we would need a lot of smaller accelerators to accelerate the particles step by step. And so we would reuse, repurpose CERN's accelerator chain for that. And if we then want to build a larger um, accelerator. The image I've shown you is really one of the very, very few options we have. Uh, if we want to connect it to the current accelerator chain, and if we want to build it somewhere where we can build it. Fun fact, I was also very, very curious, you know, if I'm going underneath the lake, if that is a problem, that is the easiest part apparently, because all you do is you just, you know, build a tunnel uh, we're not going in the water. We are going about 300 meters underground. It's way underneath the lake, but we are just building a tunnel. We will enclose it with a concrete tube 
And then even if some water leaks in, it will just, you know, flow around the, the, the concrete bundle. That's how, um, uh, among others, my friend who is doing the PhD uh, in a tunnel um, section, he explained to me, the water is the easiest problem. They, they have way other difficulties to, to face. And uh, it's true, the mountains are hard to negotiate. So we have to go around the mountains so that we do not have to dig, under, you know, inside the mountain all the way through. That would be really, really cumbersome. But... Geneva is densely populated, so that is the issue. So we have to find a geography uh, uh, layout so that we do not have too many, you know, um, buildings on top because we will have to build buildings on top of the new accelerator to then build elevator shafts how to, to bring stuff down and also in the beginning bring stuff up. <laughs> so that is the issue. Why Switzerland in the first place, I believe, was also one question. That is a very good question. I did not mention that in the beginning. I apologize. Uh, because when the founding fathers said shortly after World War II, where do we build Switzerland? Uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it's a long day. Where do we build CERN? Um, Switzerland was one of the only options that we could choose because Switzerland was neutral during World War II, which meant it was not destroyed. And Geneva in itself was already back then a very international hub. So we had already a lot of international organizations there. A lot of peace conferences took place here already. And Geneva said, hey, you want to build such a lab here? We give you a free piece of land because they were very smart because they knew if they come to Geneva and they build this organization, that means now almost 70 years later, we are still here and uh, people you know, work here. We spend money here. So that was a very nice idea by Geneva. They gave us a free piece of land. It was a very good investment on their side. So that's why, that's why Switzerland uh, was very helpful. And maybe last thing, in Switzerland, um, people here in Geneva, they speak French, but in Switzerland in itself, they also speak, you know, German and English very easily. So if you build an international organization where people from around the world, or at least in the beginning from around Europe, come together, if they speak plenty of languages, that already helps. If we were, if we were to build soon nowadays from scratch, we would never go back to Switzerland. I mean, Geneva is beautiful, don't get me wrong but we would never ever come back here because it's just too expensive. Uh, Geneva in, in itself is really, really expensive. Switzerland is expensive. We would definitely go somewhere else where it's cheaper, clearly. Uh, but now that we are here, uh, we kind of have to negotiate that um, to stay here if we want to continue. Did I miss another question? I, I believe I answered most of them, I think. I I, I think we got all of them. There's just one that came through there relating to Geneva being expensive. Someone asked if there's opportunity for high school students to visit CERN. And I know from bringing uh, students there that Geneva is really expensive. So if you could move yeah. it somewhere more affordable, that, that'd be great. Well, that would be difficult. Um, uh, but it's true. So in principle, yes, we at CERN, we are, as I said, we are super happy to show everyone our laboratory with pleasure just not at the moment i mean at the moment we do it virtually with pleasure and the moment you know corona is kind of you know manageable and we're facing the endemic phase then we will open again not just our exhibitions but also our visits and at the moment we are constructing a huge new science and education center at cern it's called science gateway where we have laboratories exhibitions awesome oh it's going to be beautiful and uh, so that means in the coming years once you know we are in safe mode again uh, meaning that the pandemic is kind of over by all means uh, we will have visits again uh, we will have um, uh, maybe even internship programs again but this is still remains to be seen at the moment we are we are, we are figuring out how to best do it but visits at CERN will definitely be possible again and um, yeah, Geneva is expensive, so you will have to negotiate how to how to finance it. But if you find a way, ah, oh, we will be more than happy to welcome you. And if you want to figure it out already, uh, you can go to visits.cern. I'm not kidding. This is the website. Uh, it looks strange, but if you paste that into your copy paste it into your browser, it will bring you to a website because CERN has a top level domain .cern. because we invented the world web, so you know we should at least have that. So visits.cern. Or maybe and, and, it's visit.cern. Sorry, I'm not sure. It might be visit.cern. I think it's visit.cern. Uh, one, of, one of the two will bring you to the website. The other one will bring you to page 404. Sorry, Michael. Oh, and I was just going to say, and, and there are a, a number of uh, really good virtual visits. And there, like, there's a handful of them that Francois, who's the head of uh, visits, tested uh, on these virtual science camps. We were like the pilot group giving feedback for a lot of the visits. 
but a lot of those are ones that are now open to teachers. So if you wanted to sign up for your class, you could get class visits. I, I think most of them have a minimum of 10 or 20 students, but it, it varies depending on what part of CERN is running the visit. And they're definitely worth checking out. So I'd, like, I'd highly recommend that either to any of the teachers uh, joining or to any students, suggest it to your teacher and try and get them to uh, organize a visit because they're, they're generally really easy to organize and they're, they're really great, like they're, they're very well done. Nice. And Ladislav just posted in the chat that he checked it is in the visitor turn. I thought so. I, yeah, something didn't feel right. Thank you for checking. Awesome. I now delayed my <laughs> maximum time by 11 minutes and I hear my daughter screaming and I really do not want to leave my partner alone with her. So I really, I apologize. I would love to talk more and discuss more questions, but I really have to go and change diapers. I, I mean, I'll, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, don't I, I would have to leave you alone now. Thank you so no, much. No, no, don't, don't apologize. It's been, it's, it's been great. Uh, thank you again, Jeff. Uh, and I hope everyone joins the other virtual camps, the one coming up next week. And yes. I'll send out a calendar with more, uh, more events coming up. And Jeff's slides, I think you're going to share them with me to send to everyone. I will share yeah. them with you. And you can then have a look at them in your, at your own time and click on all the links. Absolutely, yes. And, and as well as the recording of the session, if you're still okay with me sharing that. Oh, sure. With pleasure. Absolutely. <laughs> I had some, I, I, I had some, I, I missed poke a couple of times, but it's okay. Yeah. It's live. If you want, I can cut that out. No, Let me know. No, we'll, no. We'll, we'll, we'll talk. I'll, I'll, I'll run it by you before posting it's, anything. I, I, uh, will but, not watch, I will not watch my talk again. It's the real chef experience. That's fine. I will go but, change diapers now. Have a nice yeah, yes, again, the, Thanks again. And thank you everyone for joining. Hope to see you again. Invite friends. Uh, have a great evening, everyone. Thanks again, Jeff. Bye. Thank you. Bye.